We're going into lecture seven. Here we go. This is uh, contact languages. We're going to talk about lexical borrowing. We're going to talk about what happens when languages come into contact with another. And then our case study today is going to focus on one of my favorite countries in the world, and that is New Zealand. So how do languages um, come into being? What happens when languages come into contact or when there are speakers of a variety of different languages? Um, how do words in the English language appear? Um, and so most of you who have taken my class before, maybe you've taken an origin of the English language class you know that most of the English languages either have a Germanic root or they are borrow, borrowing words from French um, or borrowing words from Latin or Greek or many other languages. Um, so Arabic, uh, we have um, different uh, roots of a word. And so when we use this term borrowing, um, this is used to denote the process of adopting words from other languages. We borrow those words. Um, but it is kind of a misnomer because we're not going to give it back, right? Um, and that also kind of implies that there is an equal footing of both languages where I'm, I say, oh, we're just going to borrow that language um, or borrow this word from this language. Um, which is less so because, as you discovered with previous lectures, not all languages are equal. Um, the result of this process, uh, the language material itself, the word itself, um, is called a loan word. So we would say um, coffee is a loan word, okay? Um, again, it implies that there's some sort of intentionality here that we said, okay, we don't have a word to describe this liquid, so we're just going to use um, the Arabic word for it. Um, so it's it's less so that people are, are intentional with it and more so that uh, when languages come into contact, a number of things can be at play, and it just happens naturally. Um, although sometimes people make an effort um, to use a word or to create their own word to describe something. And in these contexts, we would have uh, what's called donor language. So this is where the language comes from. Usually this comes from a more quote-unquote prestigious language. Um, and again, as we discovered in previous lectures, um, it is not so much that the language itself is prestigious inherently. It's that it's more prestigious in the society in which the language varieties are spoken or the languages come into contact um, so that is where the uh, loan word comes from. And then we have the recipient language. So um, this is considered the less prestigious um, of the language, although there are uh, many ways in which the uh, loan word or the borrowed word can influence um, the language in which the speakers um, use it. So we would refer something um, if it is a calc, if something is directly translated. Um, so loan translations are the words and expressions formed from the material already existing in the language, but according to the patterns taken from another language. So we're using the um, words in English, uh, but if we're going to um, kind of take it away from uh, or borrow it from another language we're using as a literal morpheme to morphine translation so for example in latin we have this term called lingua maternal which we refer to as mother tongue so when people say what is your mother tongue they are not physically saying hey what language does your mother speak it could be the same language that your mother speaks but when we say mother tongue, we usually refer <clears throat> to it as a native language. Like, what is your native language? What is your mother tongue? And so that is a loan translation from lingua maternal, which we translated as mother tongue. Um, the phrase, it goes without saying, is a French translation. C'est la va sans dire. And so um, there's lots of other loan translations that take phrases from other languages um, and translate it into that language. So another example of a phrase would be long time no see. 
And this is a calc or a loan translation from Chinese because this is how you would say it in Chinese. So instead of taking the Chinese word or taking the French word or the Latin word, you're taking the literal word for word meaning, even though um, the, the phrase or the language in which the calc exists um, has another meaning or has uh, is stated in a way that makes sense for that language, but maybe doesn't make sense in the language that we are using it. Um, Another example we have, borrow, English has many, many, many different borrowings, so there's lots of examples here. But we have Biergarten, which is German for, um, which we took from the German, Biergarten, right? And so a Biergarten in German literally is not a garden of beers. You do not plant beers in this garden and hope that it grows. But we took it from English because it sounds like beer garden. And... Um, this is a way that we would describe like a bar. The same concept we took from German also is kindergarten, right? Kindergarten. Um, so we would say kindergarten. Um, does that actually mean that we are, you know, growing children? No, but it is, you know, it's, it sounds kind of po poetic, but the reality is we just kind of took what we, um, thought, it was in German, like how it was in English, and we borrowed it using the literal morphine to morphine translation. So let's talk about language contact, okay? So nowadays, we, we talked earlier about how different languages arise from people living in geographically different locations. So for example, in Papua New Guinea, there's many, many, many languages because people live in their different tribes and they were geographically separated um, from the other tribes. Or, um, you know, people develop this whistling language. Now we have, th this This is coming, um, this is very rare that we have a language that is still isolated. I mean, there's many examples, um, but for the most part, languages come into contact because the people come into contact, okay? So, Speakers on both sides, when you as um, an English speaker come into contact with someone who says another um, language and and the and you and you're not just like studying abroad. It's not like you are a foreigner in someone's land. It is like literally um, think back in the day when there were missionaries and you came with a mission um, to speak to you know, kind of speak another language and learn another language, um, and you need to, um, or you were like a trader, right? Like T-R-A-D-E-R, -E trader, trader, like a person, a merchant, someone selling goods, and the other side needed to use your goods, right? So this is kind of, uh, you know, it's a less, um, you know, it's, it's a less like one uh, subject who is, dominating power over somebody and more that both sides want to learn the other person's language. So this is what we call culture contact or language contact. This is in a situation where you have speakers on both sides and they're trying to kind of use this language. Um, and as we see later, this language might become a pidgin or creole. But one, what usually happens is one group will usually take the language, some words from the other person's language um, to refer to objects, activities, um, new to the first group. So um, just think back to um, early settlement of the United of America. And the British settlers would come and say, oh, what is, you know, what is this? Um, you know, this is a corn, a piece of corn that you, um, you know, pop. And it, it has this like white kernel, right? And it's a delicious snack. You say, okay, maybe it's popcorn. And so you're, you're using, um, you know, all these like Native American words. Um, and you'll see some of these. Some of these are borrowed into our everyday life. Some, some of these become place names, um, names of places. So this is uh, when languages come into contact. So it's interesting, uh, very important to denote that code switching is not the same as borrowing. We talked about code switching um, in last class and 
when we code switch, it's for different purposes, right? Like people have different language choices. Code switching is usually in a context where you're bilingual or multilingual. You understand both languages and so you can switch for a specific purpose. So that's not really the same thing as borrowing. Borrowing is is kind of like when you don't know this word. And it usually is just like a word, okay? Uh, when an utterance consists of just a, a single word from one language and all of the other words are in the other language. Um, it may be difficult to decide whether this word is a loan word or a single word switch, okay? So we're not really sure. It, we'll, we'll have to look at the context, right? Um, because some of you in your discussion board posts, um, you said, okay, so maybe in Spanish, um, you would say like, um, you know, put the book on the mesa is, are we borrowing mesa from Spanish because we don't know the word for table or are we code switching, uh, for a specific purpose? So we don't really know. Really we have to like, look back in the code. We'd have to look back on the society and the speakers and determine, you know, the choice for the, for the code switch. It's not always easy to tell. So the adopters, it can be adopted um, a variety of ways. Words can be adopted through oral speech, right? So um, immediate contact. You know, when we talk about how language is formed, oral speech is usually the fastest change. They're usually sure and undergo considerable changes in the act of adoption, okay? So um, you are you know, uh, early settlements of English and French. And you notice this pastry that is rolled up many times and is flaky and delicious. And you say, okay, um, you know, look at what is this? And they say, it's a croissant. And you say, okay, wow, this croissant is great. But they'll probably pronounce it like croissant or something like that. Um, and you'll say like, oh, this croissant is great, right? So this is... Um, you know, these, these loan words are usually pretty, pretty quick to be adopted by oral speech. Um, by written speech, however, so this is like indirect contact uh, through books, through publications. This um, early settlement, they, this, this was a little bit harder to adapt because when you are writing things in written speech, you're less likely to use the borrowed. Although, although there, um, there are borrowed words that are obviously written down in written speech, but the simulation process is very long and very laborious. Okay, and they preserve some some spelling, some of the peculiarities of the sound form. So, uh, you might still, you know, write down croissant, uh, but you're less likely to write down croissant. Um, so when words are innovated, um, their adoption style, depending on how they are adopted, either by speech or by oral speech or written speech, um, also matters. If it's a new language, uh, the borrow words with the sounds not in, it, it, if, if you have a sound in a borrowed word that is not in someone's native, in the borrowing language, it might be quote unquote nativized. Okay. So for example, Russian, the Russian language doesn't have an, an H sound, an H sound. So when German words with an H sound are borrowed into Russian, they change it to a G. So um, if they said hospital, right, which starts with an H, the Russian one would be hospital. So they will kind of make the loan word their own sound okay which makes sense right because if you're going to borrow a word it's going to be more successful if it contains the same sounds that you have it would be less likely that you would borrow a word and it would have a, a difficult sound because you're not going to use that word it's a difficult sound or and this is the case that happened with english um, the borrowed sounds may actually be incorporated into a new language. So, and this is usually in times of conquest. So, um, when English was con conquered by the French, you had these new words called, uh, named rouge or prestige, right? The zh sound. Okay. 
and the z sound, um, you know, doesn't occur in a lot of uh, other languages. It's it's borrowed from French. So borrowed words are almost always adapted to the recipient language in morphology. Okay, in morphology, morphology just means like the um, it's less likely that the sounds are borrowed, and it's more likely that um, parts of the word that carry meaning change. Okay, so um, the there's in in Shona the language Shona, um, they have this word called chihen chihenja, and this is a borrowing um, that means beautiful girl. It, it literally means beautiful girl in Shona, um, but uh, it means danger in the recipient language. Same thing for uh, gang. So French, they don't really have. Um, a word for gang, they're borrowing gang from English. And so they'll say la gang or la gang, right? So this is, um, uh, you know, they still have the le and la, right? Um, the article, but they're cha- they're using the word gang. They're borrowing the word gang. So borrowings are not completely adapted phonetically um, in that when you borrow a word, you are more likely to transform it in the way that you say it to your to your native language versus the original language. So, for example, uh, French with the stress on the final syllable. Uh, we borrow these words: machine, cartoon, police, prestige, regime, um, machine. So, these words are borrowed from French, and they would pronounce it machine, right? But we would say machine. And so um, this is how we're able to have the English phonemes phonetically from French words. Consider um, the differences between buffet versus uh, bouquet, okay? Like a a bouquet uh, of flowers. Um, Buffet, bouquet. Um, Or do we say buffet versus bouquet? Um, so this is how we're able to borrow words from French. Borrowings are also not completely adapted grammatically. We're able to use Latin and Greek, uh, words, but we're able to keep their original plural forms. For example, we have phenomenon. Okay. So the plural phenomenon is phenomena or criterion criteria okay and I notice this too when a lot of people say uh, the data okay so data is actually a plural the singular word for data is datum but I don't hear a lot of people say okay I, I notice that datum right most people would say I notice this data or I the, the data is clear right instead of the data are clear And so we are borrowing from Latin and Greek, but we're keeping, um, we're we're kind of using it in our own uh, English way with the plural forms. And then also, um, borrowings are not completely adapted orthographically. So the words from French, in which the final consonant is not read, ballet, buffet, with a diacritic mark, so we'll say cafe or cliche with a diacritic, right? Very with an with an accent mark over the e, which you don't find in any other English words, or with a uh, diagraph, um, bouquet, a q u, or o u, bouquet, banquet. So this is um, very 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 uh, interesting how we say banquet. Uh, but we don't say banquet. Um, and that we would say is integration, fully integration into English. So some of the loan words that we have, we have um, potato. So potato is actually, it comes from this indigenous language of Haiti. It no longer exists um, in Haiti. It's kind of a language that was, um, you know, 
well, we talked last class about languages that died, right? So it's kind of like a dead language. But we still have loan words from this language because when the uh, first conquerors came to, settlers came to Haiti, they were able to see the sweet potato and say, what is this potato? And then they were able to um, call it taino, right? Or sorry, pot- potato. And so um, their word for pot- potato was patata, which they then incorporate into Spanish. Potato or patata. The same word for um, coffee. So coffee, um, you know, from Arabic, kawa. And then uh, that was borrowed into Turkish and became kave, right? So the loan words themselves have a little bit of, um, you know, integration into the recipient language. So there are words, cultural borrowings are words that fill gaps in the recipient's language's store of words because they stand for objects or concepts that are new to the language's culture. Okay, it's a cultural borrowing. And so we have many examples from other languages. Um, from Arabic, we have admiral, assassin, mask, mattress, racket, syrup, zenith. From Chinese, we have junk, ketchup. Hebrew, we have camel, ethnic, julebi, paradise. Greek, we have biology, coma, method, science. There's lots of different um, Greek names. Um, so, for example, all of the coronavirus variants that we had have been Greek. Native American, I talked about earlier, cockroach, squash, caucus. Um, Russian, we have bistro, disinformation, mammoth, Sputnik. Spanish, we have banana, cannibal, cork, potato, sherry. Um, so these are words that we have um, borrowed from these languages because, again, someone probably showed up and said, you know, what is this? And I've never seen this before. And, you know, the word was squash. We would use squash because we don't have a word for it. And instead of making a word for it, we just kind of borrow it. So core borrowing are words that duplicate elements that the recipient language already has in its word store, okay, its word repertoire. So in the speech of bilinguals who regularly use both of their languages, it could be considered code switching. Um, The magnetism of the dominant culture of the donor language motivates speakers to borrow core elements. So in English, English is most often the donor, not necessarily the recipient, okay? But there's still some doublets, doublets that we still use in English where the donor variants are considered more prestigious even today, okay? So spider or arachnid. We have two words that mean the same thing, but the more prestigious variety is arachnid. Same thing for moon, lunar, star, stellar, um, in French, for example, we use words um, that are borrowed from French, like pork uh, for pig or veal. Uh, so these words are more prestigious and imply that the, the food is cooked. So we would say uh, pork instead of pig. I wouldn't say I'm going to eat pig. I would say I was going to eat pork. So there's a prestigious variety, even in English, because we are core borrowing from French. Some words have also come into English from Latin more than once through French or another Romance language at a time or directly from Latin. So chief or ch- uh, chef, chef, right? Um, from Latin through French. Because English borrows so much from its neighbors um, and from various other languages, there are different ways in which um, these languages can come back around and be reborrowed. So, for example, canal we borrowed from uh, French. We turned it to channel, right? Um, but in French, they were able to take it back and refer to it as le channel. So they have two words. They have a can- canal and channel. Um, which, 
you know, mean different things uh, in French, but in English, we're able to use these words um, to denote that one variety has prestige over the other. There's also the case of reverse borrowing. So reverse borrowing replaces the existing borrowings with native words. So this is where maybe we want to borrow the words, but we are kind of translating it into um, our own language or we are making up new words for this word. So for example, computer. Um, if you go to a lot of countries um, and speak a lot of languages, computer has different meanings. So computer can mean um, in Spanish it would be la computadora, right? But in other languages, um, computer has a different word. So French, they didn't want to use the word computer. Um, the French are notorious for not borrowing from English. They kind of resent the borrowing from English. Instead, they, they created this new term, ordinateur, to mean computer. Um, when the AIDS epidemic was raging in the 1980s, in Iceland, they had a term for um, AIDS, um, and they called it aioni, aioni. And this was an Icelandic term meaning destruction, destruction of the immune system, right? So they were trying to kind of match um, AIDS in their own way, uh, even though AIDS is an acronym in English. Telephone, right? Telephone. So telephone, hatif in Arabic. This means a mysterious voice um, in Arabic folklore. Um, hacker, so someone who hacks, hekke. Hek in Chinese, this means a dark or wicked visitor. So these words are being integrated in their native language, um, replacing the existing borrowings with these new words, okay, that kind of sound similar or mean um, different things. Um, these reverse borrowings actually make great fodder for bilingual jokes. So if you know the um, Humpty, Humpty Dumpty tale, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. So in French, it's rendered as uh, c'est on a all, which means get surprised at the Paris market. Okay. Um, so that is their version because it, it sounds like sat on a wall. That is their borrowing. Okay. So they are able to kind of use the same sounds to mean different things. Um, and I have a little joke here about how when someone types LMAO, LMAO, they uh, imagine a French cat. Kind of a, a borrowing of le, right? The French syllable uh, and mal, even though that's not what cat is, but um, that's the sound a cat would make in French and in English, I guess. Um, borrowing the other way. So other groups may dominate, or sorry, may, may borrow from the language that is dominated. So this mean, claim that they might have an understanding of the local culture or might sound exotic, right? Um, so this happens when you are trying to uh, not use a word in your language, but use the borrowed word. Um, maybe because you want to sound different, or maybe you want to give an air as if you are speaking another language. Um, so mahalo in Hawaiian English. So instead of using, um, you know, big thumbs up or, you know, you'd say, okay, mahalo, right? Or share in Louisiana English and Louisiana Creole. And so this is your way of, um, you know, kind of maintaining that prestige. Like we talked about earlier with croissant versus croissant. Right. So maybe you go to the baker and you say, OK, I really love uh, three croissants. Right. So this is uh, maybe your way of borrowing the other way around. You want to maintain a certain level of superiority. So now that we discussed different ways that languages can borrow loan words, Today we're going to feature uh, our lesson on New Zealand. Okay, so New Zealand, um, I've had the 
pleasure opportunity to visit New Zealand twice and study abroad there. So I stayed with the host family in Auckland, which is the in the North Island. Um, New Zealand, New Zealand's uh, coat of flags features, uh, you know, a coat of arms, sorry, uh, features uh, their Maori people, their indigenous people. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the, the native, uh, you know, things about New Zealand. So we have sheep, we have shipbuilding, um, we have, uh, the, I think the Southern Cross, which is, I think their star, their constellation. Um, although there have been talks in the past about changing their flag, uh, and also the New Zealand flag and Australian flag look very similar except the New Zealand flag has red stars instead of white stars so there's uh three different official languages in New Zealand there's English there's the indigenous language Maori and then there is uh New Zealand sign language so um the sign language became an official language in 1987 and here is a uh, dictionary, the New Zealand Sign Language here. So some history. New Zealand um, was first a country that was settled by Eastern Polynesians way, way, way back when. So between 1250 and 1300, uh, they're able to trace back the patterns of um, early Maoris and um, trace their settlement. Um, and it wasn't until the first Europeans that to reach New Zealand were the Dutch. Um, but they did not revisit New Zealand until explorer, British explorer James Cook mapped almost the entire coastline. Um, and then there was lots of trading. So they traded European food, metal tools, weapons for timber, for Maori food, for artifacts and water. And the introduction of the potato I feel like this lecture is sponsored by a potato because I've said it like five times um but it transformed Maori agriculture and and warfare potatoes provided a reliable food surplus which enabled longer and more sustained military campaigns uh, the resulting musket wars which had 600 battles in a span of like 40 years killing about 30,000 to 40,000 Maori so um, kind of like other colonial histories, very violent. So, um, as early from, uh, as early as the early 19th century, uh, there were a lot of missionaries that began to settle New Zealand. Um, and then they were trying to convert, uh, the Maori population. And then in 1788, Captain Arthur Philip assumed position as governor of the new British colony of South Wales, New South Wales, which, according to this commission, included New Zealand. So um, if you remember from his geography class or history class, uh, you know, the British Empire had already conquered over Australia. They had sent um, kind of their fugitives to Australia. So they were trying to also annex this colony of uh, New Zealand as well, which they consider part of their property. Um, by 1840, there are about um, 2,000 Europeans, or they, what they would call Pakia, what they would call um, someone of European descent, living in New Zealand, so most of them are British. And at this point, there are no laws or police to stop them from committing crimes. And they just had a really big influx of people moving to New Zealand. It got to be a real problem. This is when the missionaries, they asked the British for help. They asked the British government to be more involved. And they said, because they were, you know, they were trying to look out for the Maori. And they had said that they would be better protected from lawless Pakia uh, and illegal land sales. Because the Maori were have the, having these treaties with the early European settlers, and it wasn't very clear, you know, what they were written in treaty. They could have signed off on anything. Now, whether the missionaries actually wanted to help, I, that's you know for history to decide. Um, but for the most part, they you know really 
that that's why they wanted the New Zealand colony to be under the British. So more and more immigrants came. These conflicts led to the New Zealand wars of the 1860s and 1870s, uh, resulting in the loss and confiscation of a lot of Maori land. And very bloody conflict um, to where, you know, uh, the there had to be some sort of true, you know, this, um, it, it culminated in a kind of, settlement between the Maori chiefs and the British, right? So because New Zealand was an independent country, the British couldn't just walk in and make their demands. The Maori chiefs controlled their tribal areas, and so the British needed to make a treaty with them first. And so the the biggest treaty, the main treaty that really set off the uh, series of events was called the Treaty of Waitanga, and this was on February 5th, 1840. Uh, and it wasn't really their constitution, but it stipulated a lot of um, a lot of things where it ceded over the entire country of New Zealand over to British rule. So the person who translated this text, this treaty from English to Maori, uh, his name was Henry Williams, but he was not an expert in the Maori language, right? So again, the Maoris were kind of signing off on what they thought was like a treaty in which the British would control their people, right? But instead, what they found out was that the treaty said, oh, I'm not only let it, giving you control of the people, I'm giving you control of the land. So, um, you know, most Maori signed the Maori version, which means that that's the one that should be accepted. Um, and then also it's important to note that not all chiefs signed a treaty. So some simply refused to sign or were never even asked to sign, right? So um, that's a real problem when it comes to treaties because you need everyone to sign, you need everyone to be on the same page. Um, but their translator mistranslated the word for governance, you know, because governance means, you know, someone who's governing the people. And in English, it means also governing the land, where in Maori, it means something completely different. So, um, you know, just what I said about, you know, in the first article, the English version gives the Queen of England sovereignty over New, New Zealand. And the Maori version uses the word kawatanga for sovereignty. So this means gov governorship, right? Um, but they should have used the word mana or ranga turatanga. The Maori believed the treaty would help them keep their mana or control. So kind of like a parliamentary government where I'm going to sign this treaty, but I still have control over my land. The queen would be, you know, governed, but she would not control New Zealand. But in signing over this treaty, the British believed that they had achieved possession and control over the land and the people. And as we've seen in previous lectures, um, after, you know, a lot of conquests, when a col colonialist language comes to be, you see that the people um, start to use English more and the Maori language less. And you see this decline of Maori population who are fluent. Um, so the people who have, most people today have very low fluency of Maori. Um, again, you know, we talked about language revitalization and, and New Zealand actually does a, you know, fairly good job of, um, of having Maori centers, Maori schools, Maori language revitalization, but for prominently, um, you know, people, there are more and more people who have low fluency in Maori. So it, of you know, uh, apart from the uh, language, 77% of New Zealanders, they identify themselves as Pakia or European or from European descent, uh, whereas about 14.6% identify themselves as Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, and 6.9% of Pacific peoples, 9.2% as Asians, and 1% as others. So 
one of the reasons why compared to you know Cameroon um, or other places where there are a lot of different language varieties why Maori revitalization, revitalization programs are successful is because you only have one language um, indigenous language you know um, it'd be very different for example if in the United States we're able to revitalize Native American, some Native American languages, but it's a little bit complicated because we have so many and so many different cultures and so many different tribes and so many different languages. Whereas in New Zealand, it's a little bit easier because the Maori, um, they do, you know, they have one language and they also, um, when in language revitalization, that's, you know, that's the kind of their language. And it's also, you know, one of the official languages. So the native language is used only in New Zealand, but not a lot of people speak it. Um, it originated in isolation until the 19th century in New Zealand. And probably 130,000 people know some Maori, but the rest of the country speaks English. Um, but, and this is what is interesting, the loan words, the borrowed words in New Zealand pretty much all come from Maori. A lot, a lot of it, the majority of loan words come from Maori. So, lexical borrowing from Maori is both unique to New Zealand and conspicuous part of New Zealand English. Um, the most common inclusion of Maori words in English started around 1970. And, you know, because they only have one indigenous language, it's now an official language. And really, having this status in the official language just means a lot. We talked about this with Guatemala. You know, Guatemala has 22 recognized languages. Uh, but having an indigenous language, it really means that you have an acceptance of um, indigenous folks. Now, I'm not talk I'm not saying that, you know, everywhere is accepted and, and racism doesn't exist in New Zealand. Uh, definitely does, just like in the United States and a lot of places in the world. But enabled to um, have one's indigenous native language as an official language, um, it does a lot for the language and does a lot for the community. So the reasons for borrowing from Maori, uh, it might be the most economic way to refer to something. It has a distinctive national identity, um, expresses empathy with uh, Maori culture, its values, its aspirations. It makes an impact on the audience and it has a precision of meaning. Okay, so uh, again, with the treaty, like, you know, some words in English governance is can mean a lot of things. You know, because English is a language that has changed a lot. It has a, um, evolved. Uh, and Maori has evolved too, but if you want to really emphasize, uh, em emphasize something, you can really, you can use Maori. Um, you should use Maori as a, a, a way to express uh, the pre precise meaning. So, um you know, is this code switching when people use both languages? Well, there's a general understanding of many Maori lexical items because in New Zealand, there's a lot of, um, you know, integration of these loan words. Um, but you also have an increasing acceptance of the bicultural nature of New Zealand society. So this really supports the view that subdominant languages exert their influence on their dominant counterparts, mainly via lexical borrowing. So a lot of people in New Zealand, they really accept um, Maori and, and Maori words and Maori language in their everyday life because that's what makes them part of Kiwi society, part of New Zealand society. Um, to uh, kind of showcase some of the Maori words, here's a video. It's an advertisement um, about um, driving into preface. So I think a lot of uh, so the government made a campaign because a lot of people in um, New Zealand were driving around without their license. And uh, so they were able to use a lot of Maori loan words. So I want you to kind of watch this video and maybe in one of your discussion posts, you can talk about the different Maori loan words. Um, but try to kind of pick out what you see uh, for some of you who are English speakers. Maybe this, you know, some of these Maori words might be different for you. So the Maori words commonly found in New Zealand English 
um, Aotearoa, which is the word for New Zealand, um, Pakia, which is like non-Maori or European New Zealanders, uh, Wanu, um, actually I think their uh, WH makes a, um, an F sound, uh, which means extended family, Iwi, which means tribe, Mana means authority, prestige, uh, he, Hui meaning to Rio, the Maori language, um, Maori meeting house, Karanga, call of a welcome, right? Kia ora. So, you know, when I, when I went to New Zealand for the first time, they would automatically, you know, welcome you in the Maori language. So they would say kia ora, good day, right? Um, and this is something to where they have so many uh, loan words, it's become part of their culture. So it's not necessarily that they're code switching, um, because code switching implies that, you know, maybe you're fluent in this language, but it is just kind of part of the New Zealand English now. There's also lots of words referring to flora and fauna. So this is what we talk about when we talk, you know, what we mean by precision, right? So instead of using English words for these native terms, there's already these Maori words that exist. So kiwi, right? So kiwi would um, is like a flightless bird. It's only found in New Zealand. But now this has kind of been integrated into society and in New Zealand culture where a kiwi is, um, you know, kind of a metaphor for their word for someone from New Zealand, you know, a New Zealander, a Kiwi. So they would say like, um, oh, he's a fellow New Zealander. He's a fellow Kiwi. Or this is, he's speaking Kiwi English. He's speaking New Zealand English. Um, the Bowery culture also is prominent um, because of its haka. So this is a traditional dance that they would do at the beginning of any sports games. And um, it can be quite intimidating, right? So you're supposed to like stick out your tongue and you're supposed to yell and you're supposed to, you know, do a lot of girl sounds and you're supposed to uh, show the whites of your eyes and, you know, and but it just has become uh, a great part of their culture. Uh, and so this is a video featuring the haka performed at many different uh, international sporting events. So this is kind of how the haka became really famous and endemic to New Zealand um, because this, you know, this part of Maori culture is very important to them. And I will also say it's not only, um, traditionally it's not only been men that done it, it's also men and women. Um, the term black, right, also refers to a lot of New Zealand sports teams. All Blacks is their rugby team, very famous. And this also derives from um, a description from when the British settlers came and they said, like, uh, you know, they played a good game. They looked like they were all back, but it got translated to black. And so they've kind of incorporated this into their sports teams, part of their culture identity. Small blacks, baby blacks, wheel blacks, ice blacks, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like how in Baltimore we kind of have like a crab as a symbol. So you might have a lot of like crabs everywhere. They're, um, they're kind of like a cultural icon is like all blacks uh, or kiwi or uh, the silver fern. So uh, food, right? So um, what I'm trying to show here is that it's not always about language. Sometimes it's about culture, right? So they're not only borrowing the language, they're also borrowing the culture because language and culture are so closely tied. And so, uh, you know, in traditional barbecues, it's common to cook with a, what's called a Maori hangi. It's an oven that's dug into the ground and then, um, you know, lined with red hot stones and covered with vegetation, the food is cooked on top, vegetation is added with water sprinkled on top, and then they steam the food. So the, um, you know, it's used for special occasions with men digging the hole and women preparing the food. So very, you know, the, the way that, you know, Kiwi, uh, you know, even though it's a predominantly 
Pakia European descent um, demographic. They really tried to integrate the uh, Maori in their everyday culture. It's part of their history. It's part of their culture, right? I'm not saying that, you know, there's not conflict, but it's a little di- bit different from uh, what we saw with uh, Cameroon or for with Belgium, for instance. And this is a very long video um, documentary on New Zealand English, but I really highly uh, recommend that you watch it because I want you to get a taste of what New Zealand sounds like. Um, just to give an example, New Zealanders, instead of saying fish and chips, they'll say fish and chips, chips. Uh, and, uh, instead of saying like, um, parking deck, they'll say parking dick. And they also have like a rising intonation, right? At the end of their word. So they'll be like, how are you today? Um, Again, I'm doing a very bad impersonation, but I highly encourage that you watch this video because it kind of gives you uh, an overview. And also, again, watch out for the Maori loanwords. So here are some discussion questions. What are some loanwords in English? Like where, um, where do these words originate from? Why were they borrowed? Maybe you can dig into the history of the language, kind of like potato. <laughs> What words in our language do you see are borrowed from English? Okay, so for example, Japanese borrows a lot from English. Korean, um, South Korean English, or South Korean borrows a lot from English. And how do they transform the English into their own language? And also, uh, discussion question three is, what is the role of the Maori language and Maori culture in New Zealand? Interested to hear your thoughts um, and uh, very, very uh, keen, as we say in New Zealand English, uh, to hear your thoughts on the discussion board.